dad. How about that? Um, all right. Hey, we're, uh, we're going to be in Psalm 51 today. Uh, so that's page 90 uh, and 92 in your scripture journal. So if you have your scripture journal, grab it. If you don't have one, there should be one uh, nearby and a seat nearby. Feel free to grab that and, uh, and follow along. And, uh, and uh, we're going to be kind of diving in verse by verse. We're going to go through this one a little bit different than we've gone through the last couple. Instead of reading the whole thing and making application, we're going to kind of make application as we go. Uh, and so um, I hope that will... Uh, give you guys and encourage you guys. I took a lot of notes on this one, so you can see the inside of my scripture journal on this one, um, and you'll you'll know why uh, pretty soon, because it's it's one of those, you know. Uh, so uh, Psalm 51, I'm just going to jump right in uh, to verse 1, where David, this is a psalm of David, so uh, he's writing, and he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love and according to your great compassion. Now, when, we, when we're talking about Psalm 51, uh, and it starts with this, this call from, from David to God saying, God, I want you to have mercy on me according to your unfailing love and your great compassion. You have to think, uh, when you're reading this, you have to think Exodus 34. Okay, uh, it, it, we've talked about Exodus 34 a lot at our church, but Exodus 34 is the spot in the book of Exodus where God comes to Moses and tells Moses who he is. And he says, I am gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loyal love. That, that's the same thing as, you know, unfailing or steadfast love. It's the word has said in Hebrew. And, and so what what David is doing is he's, he's saying, God, this is who you are. This is who you said you are. And this is who I need you to be for me. Because he's going through a hard time. Look at, uh, look at the end of verse 1. It says, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin." For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. There's something really important that we need to pay attention to in Psalm 51, and that's there are seven personal pronouns that David uses in the first two verses, or first three verses um, of, of Psalm 51. This psalm is about him, and it's specifically about how he has sinned. It's, a, it, 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 it's specifically about how he's fallen short. Okay. Now the word sin, uh, it, it just means to miss the mark. So if you're thinking of like, you know, a bullseye or something like that, it's, it's missing the mark. That's what sin means. Uh, I, I would think missing the target altogether probably more so than missing the bullseye though. You know what I mean? Like, like it, it's, it's missing, missing the mark. That's what sin is. And he's saying, please blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. This is about him. And this is something that I think is so uh, important for us as followers of Jesus, but also just as, as people who are trying to uh, do right in the world, and especially those of us who are dads, man, we really need to be more, more willing to admit when we've got it wrong. I, I think, I think it, is, it is really, really, really tough, and it is really, really, really hard uh, for whatever reason for us to admit when we've got it wrong. And when we've done something wrong, and when we've made the mistake, and when we're the one that's sinned and fallen short, it's not hard to necessarily realize it. It's not hard to feel it or know that we've fallen short. It's just hard to admit it. It's hard to be honest about it. It's hard to come up. You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of situations where like, we respond because of the way other people tend to uh, act toward us or, or come toward us or, or whatever the case might be. And, and a lot of times we like to point fingers in other directions when something goes wrong. And, and we fail to really like, pay attention to where we've failed and where we've messed it up. And this is true of me as much as it is anybody. But I think one of the most amazing marks of David being a man after God's own heart 
David's a man after God's own heart, and if you don't know, the sin that he's referring to is a sin where he committed adultery with this woman that he saw bathing on a roof, and her name's Bathsheba. You can read about this story in 2 Samuel 11 and 12, uh, but, but he sees Bathsheba bathing on a roof, and he says, I want to have her, and so he summons her to his quarters, like thinking every woman would want to be summoned to the king's quarters, but that's not really the case. In fact, that it seems as if Bathsheba probably doesn't want to sleep with David, but David uh, forces her to do so. And, uh, and so it's really uh, kind of a, a, a wretched story, maybe more wretched than we tend to read it. Well, then he decides, uh, after he impregnates her, to then bring her husband home from the battlefield, that he might sleep with her, so that then, you know, it'll look like a legitimate baby. Uh, but that didn't work uh, because Uriah, her husband, was such an honorable man. He would not go to bed with his wife while his, his soldiers were still out fighting a battle. And so he gets sent back out by David to the front lines to be killed and murdered in battle so that he can then take Bathsheba as his wife and make it look all legitimate. My guess is none of you have done that, right? Right? fair okay so so here's here's the deal the sin that he's committed is really egregious it's really dark it's deceptive it's also just rude and inconsiderate and dehumanizing toward people who bear the image of god i mean it's it is really really awful stuff but i think um one of, the, one of the things that makes David such a man after God's own heart is that when he is confronted by his sin, he'll come clean. See, there, there's a word that we like to use, uh, in, in, or that, that is used a lot, talks about integrity. And, and we like to think, I think, of integrity as um, doing the right thing. Right, but, but I think it also takes a lot of integrity to be someone who is willing to confess, who's willing to confront their sin and actually mourn over it. That, that, that there's some integrity that's in this confession that David lays out there, that he's gonna be a man of integrity and when he's got it wrong, he's gonna go and he's gonna ask for forgiveness. He's gonna confess his sin. Now, I think it's really interesting that David says in verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. He's saying, when I, I, think, it's, I think it's really interesting how, how David says it's against you. Even though he sinned against Uriah, he sinned against Bathsheba, he even sinned against his son who had yet to be born. <laughs> Like, like, in, like, he still says, against you, God, have I sinned. Because any sin that we commit against another human being is a sin against God because those image bearers are supposed to be representatives of God. When I look at you, I should see, like, a God-born creation, the most beautiful and God-ordained creation of all creation. And when you see another human being, you should think the same thing. When you sin against another human being, you're not sinning just against that person. You are sinning against someone who reflects the image of God. And therefore, you are sinning against him. And so we have to be really, really careful when, when we think that, like, you know, we, we do something to someone and it's sinful and it's wrong and we are not broken hearted over that because it's not just it's not just that I've hurt a person's feelings or I've been rude to someone or I've taken advantage of someone or I've deceived someone or I've lied to someone it's not just that I've done that it's that like I didn't value their God given image enough to treat them the way God would desire me to treat them and that is the crux of what David's getting at here in verse 4. He knows. He knows the beauty in which we've been created. He talks about it in Psalm 8, which we'll deal with later in the summer. But it's just this beautiful, like, 
confession, I think, of him saying, you know what, against you and you only. He says, you're right to judge. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. That's something else that we should pay attention to is like you, you might want to get frustrated or upset with God when there's some sort of consequence for your sin. Anyone ever gotten upset with God when there's been a consequence for sin? Am I the only one? Like, like when, when you make a mistake and then there's a consequence to that that God has put into motion because he put the world into effect in a certain way. And then we're like, God, how dare you make this, let this happen to me? It's like, are you kidding me? Like, he can do whatever he wants. He's the only one who's perfect. He's the only one who's good. Right? This is what Jesus says in this gospel. He said, no one's good except for God alone. And man, it's, it's, this, it's this, like, heartfelt understanding of, like, I know who you are. You're righteous. Whatever you determine, whatever you decide, however you choose to execute judgment against me for what I've done, you're justified. You have every right to do that. Whatever consequence comes, you have every right to issue that consequence. I think that's, a, that's something we don't think about very often. I want to go back to verse 3 for just a second because I, I, I forgot to mention this. And, uh, but I do think that this is a really important part where he says that my sin is always before me. You guys know the story of Cain and Abel? So in Genesis chapter 4... Uh, Cain, uh, God comes to Cain and he says, look, you need to be careful because sin is crouching at your door and wants to have you. It's right there. Always before you. And you and I should always know it's never far away. It's never far away. The, the demonic spirits of this world, the evil of our enemy is always right there. Waiting for us to give in to some sort of desire of our flesh and lead us into sin. It's always there waiting to have us. It's never far off. And we should always keep an eye out and pay attention to that. Verse 5, he says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Um, he's saying that I'm born in the flesh and being born in the flesh, I'm prone to sin. I'm prone to wander. I'm prone to give my life over to the flesh and to that sin because I'm born that way. But I love how he talks about in verse six, he says, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. So notice he says, I was sinful from the time that I came out of the womb but in the womb, you desired faithfulness. From the moment that you allowed me to be conceived, you desired me to be faithful and walk with you. Not only that, but you taught me wisdom in that secret place. That there's something that God forms in us, even as embryos and as babies in a womb that come to know the difference as like that, 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 that when we get out, we, we also, yeah, we're, we're, we're flesh and we're gonna be drawn to the flesh and drawn by and enticed by things that, that like appeal to our flesh, but there's also a sense of where God has created us to know the difference, to have the wisdom of what it means to do right and do wrong. That he creates us with that ability. He creates us with the ability and the, the, un, the, the ability to understand the difference between those two things. Before we are born. And so we, we, yes, are prone to sin. Absolutely. But we also know when we've sinned. We know when we've done right and when we've done wrong because God created us that way. And when we've done wrong, we, we need to be more like David in this sense and come and offer confession and come and say, you know what, God, I, forgive me because I've sinned against you. I've done what is wrong in your sight and in your eyes. He goes on, verse 7, he says, cleanse me with hyssop, which is just like an herbal supplement that they would use to clean things with, maybe clothes, but Typically, this this type of uh, this type of um, 
mineral was used uh, to cleanse lepers. So in, in order to reestablish them back into a community. So the, the idea being that I am as unclean as those who are like ostracized from the community and put out of the community. That's how, that's how dark and, 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 and unclean I am. He says, but if you'll cleanse me with hyssop, I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. I, I, when I read verse 9, I can't help but think of the cross. I can't help but think of the cross. And Jesus is on the cross, and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? The idea is that God had turned his face away. Right? You guys know the song, How Deep the Father's Love? And that line in that song that says, The Father turns his face away. The, the, the wounds which mar the chosen one lead many sons to glory. Like, that's what I think of when I read verse 9, is God, like, hide your face. And God hid his face from, from Jesus being crucified. Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? But it wasn't that he was forsaking Jesus. It was that Jesus had let the sins of the world be put on him, and he was turning his face away from the sin, and he uses Jesus as a way to blot out and wash away through his broken body and his shed blood, our sin. So that if we believe that Jesus died on the cross for us and that he rose from the dead, that we can have a new life where we can come to God and we can confess and we can, we can be honest about our sin and say, God, please forgive me. And he will. First John says, what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called his children. And that is what we are. He has led all of us into this place. If we have, have confessed Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we've given our life to him, he, he, is, he has given all of us a new identity as his sons and daughters. And that's, that's a beautiful hope to put um, our, our lives in. That, that he washes away the places of us that are, that are broken and he walks with us daily so that we can continue to try and deal with and remove sin from our life. Which is what verse 10 really goes toward. He asked God to like create something anew in him. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. When I was reading that, I thought to myself, um, I, 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 I kind of paraphrased it just in the, in the side margin because like what I heard when I was reading it, what I felt like God was saying to me is create in me an undivided passion. One that's, one that's not divided um, but by like, oh, I, I have a passion for this and I have a passion for, for you. Like, no, 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 I want an undivided passion. I want my heart to be fully passionate and turned in your direction, in your ways, for your will and your desires. And then uh, the, the steadfast spirit, an unwavering desire. One that never, never shifts, none that never changes. I want it to be steadfast. I want it to be faithful. I want my desire to always be for you and your will, God. Do that, in my, do that in me. How amazing would that prayer be if we all began to pray that prayer? If we all began to pray a prayer that said, God, create in me a pure heart. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. Give me undivided passion and unwavering desire for you and your ways. God. How amazing would that be if we all began to pray that and want and, and truly want that. Not just pray it, but truly want it too. Like that it's our heart that we actually want that. He says, "Do not cast me from your presence or take your holy spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me." 
I think this is interesting that this is obviously before Jesus. Uh, David writes this, but, but he's talking about the Holy Spirit, right? And a lot of times we don't think about the Holy Spirit being talked about a whole lot in the Old Testament. We think about it being a, you know, post-resurrection thing that takes place, that, that Jesus, you know, allows his Spirit to uh, be, you know, put on, um, you know, all, all people when, when they make a confession of faith like this is a uh like what what Ephesians says is like a signet ring stamp of his approval right it's like this is this is how you are sealed to say like you are his like he's put a claim on you by his body being broken his blood being shed and you're in his spirit is is that claim and uh, I just think it's so interesting that it seems as if David already understands this David understands that the Spirit of God has been on him, and he's been walking with God his whole life. And now this could be because David is one of few people who's truly set apart and anointed by God in the Old Testament, and so maybe he had like a special dose of the Holy Spirit that maybe most people walking around hadn't gotten yet. But, but the reality is he realized that like, oh, I am always in the presence of my Father, I'm always in his presence. He is always with me. This is the joy of my salvation. The, the, the joy and the, the, the proof and the hope of our salvation is the Holy Spirit alive in us, giving us a spirit to sustain us and keep us moving in the right direction toward where God wants us to go. And David seems to understand that really beautifully. Um, as he's walked with God his whole life. And I, and I want to just encourage you. I want, I want to challenge you. I really want to challenge you. I know the, the, the Holy Spirit can be, you know, uh, sometimes a bad word in some places, right? Like, you go to some churches and it's like, well, we don't really talk about the Holy Spirit and all that stuff because it's kind of scary uh, what the Holy Spirit might start doing in your life, right? And, and it is. If you start following the Holy Spirit and you let the Holy Spirit have your life, it it will change you. And we need to be more willing and desiring of that. Not avoiding it. Not afraid of it. We should want it like David wants it. We should cry out for it like he cries out for it. God, give me your presence. Give me your spirit. Let me walk in it. And let it be the source that sustains me each day. Don't let me walk by my own strength, but let me be led by your spirit. Right? I mean, this is what Paul's talking about in Galatians 5 when he's talking about, like, walking in step with the, the flesh or walking in step with the spirit. And as we walk in step with the spirit, he does sustain us. He does transform us. He does change us. He gives us what we need in order to... Um, live a life that's worthy of the gospel. In verse 13, it says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are my God and Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You know, um, I love the fact that this morning we started uh, with the, that song, My Testimony. Uh, I, I, I love the words of that, <laughs> of that song. It said, this is my testimony, right? That, but that like, my testimony is that I was lost and now I'm found because of Christ. I was lost, but, but you saved me. In spite of my sin, you loved me and forgave me, right? Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his love for us in this, that even while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us when we were sinners. Like this. Like what David had done. He died for us in that state. He didn't say, clean yourself up, and then I'll get on a cross for you. He said, I love you so much I'm gonna get on a cross for you so that your sin no longer separates you from me and we can have a relationship together. And so now you have a testimony, just like David. 
He says, God, if you'll save me, if you'll restore the joy of my salvation, I'll have a, I'll have a testimony to speak to other sinners, to know that you are gracious, that you are slow to anger, that you are compassionate and abounding in loyal love. I will be able to declare the goodness of God because he saved me, because he loved me, because he brought me out of darkness and into light. You have a story. We all have a story. And that's what David's talking about. He's saying, man, like if, if, I, if, I, if you give me an opportunity, I'm gonna share my story of how you've forgiven me, of how you've loved me, of how you have saved me. Why do, why, why, why do we not get excited about opportunities to share what God's done in our life with people who are struggling? Letting them know that there is a hope beyond their hopelessness that they're in because of their sin or because of their struggle. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, we have, we have a light to shine. Don't hide it under a bushel. All right? Let's let it shine. It's not us. It's him in us. And I just love the fact that he understands that. I love verse 15. He says, open up our lips and I'll declare your praise. A lot of times this is a call to worship. A lot of people use that as a call to worship. They'll, they'll you know, start up on stage and they'll read Psalm 51, 15. And they'll say, uh, open up our lips and we will declare your praise. And it's a great call to worship. But, but the reality is, is like uh, when we start to sing, do we realize that we're singing about our salvation and our hope and our, and our life given to us by God. I think so many of us are so reserved when it comes to the way we worship. So many of us are just like, I'm just gonna stand here and stare at those words right there. They're right there. I'm just gonna read them. Just gonna read them. That's, that's, that's totally fine. If that's where you're at, it's totally fine. I get it. It's weird, you know, to like sing with other people in a room and you know, you don't do that. You only sing in the shower. I get it. All right. Um, it's probably Taylor Swift too. But uh, here, here's the deal. Like, we have a reason to sing. If you've been saved and you've been set free from sin, you have a reason to sing Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness. That's who you are. Because he made a promise to you, and he kept it. He made a way for you. He worked a miracle by, by overcoming death and sin and the grave for you. We have a reason to sing. Let us not forget that. Let us not forget when we show up here, we have a reason to sing. Verse 16. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. You know, as much as we have a reason to sing, um, maybe something that's holding you back from singing is that you, you haven't truly come in touch with the depths of your sin. A lot of people, I think, show up to church uh, on Sunday um, and they've lived a life completely counter to the ways and the desires of God. Um, and then they show up thinking that what God desires for them is to show up 
to a place like this on a Sunday. I, if you think that what God wants for you is to show up here, to listen to my foolish mouth talk about Jesus, um, like, y'all, y'all are crazy. If you think that that's what he desires for you, if you think like, oh, that's what's going to make him happy with me, I got to do, I got I to gotta, I gotta be, you know, a good Christian person, so that means I go to church. I mean, that, that's the equivalent of what, what David's talking about here. I'm going to go through all the motions, I'm going to do all the sacrifices, I'm going to do all the offerings, I'm going to do all the stuff, because that will please him. That will make him happy with me again. And if that's what you think, you're wasting your time. What God desires is he desires us to know that, man, like, I'm, my, my sin means I don't deserve any of it. And yet he gives me eternal life. He gives me an opportunity to walk with him every single day, even though I'm not worthy of being in his presence. He says, you can have eternal union, eternal relationship with me right now. And so, man, I'm broken over my sin. I I think, don't, don't think that God desires religious observance. He does not ever desire religious observance. That was never a part of of, of what he wanted. He wanted people who would walk with him. And when they made a mistake, that they would own up to it. And they wouldn't hide. I don't think his issue with Adam and Eve, um, I don't think his issue was so much um, the mistake that they made, it was that when they made the mistake, they ran and hid. And I think there's a sense of where, like, we, we oftentimes, we, we sin, and either it doesn't, it, it, like, we, we don't mourn it at all, right? What Jesus talks about when he says, blessed are those who mourn. He's talking about those who mourn over their sin. And, like, w- like there are so many of us who drink way too much, and we think, oh, we were just having a good time. And there's some of us who look at other people um, with with indignation or with rage or with anger. There's so many of us that just lie and think, oh, a little lie never hurt anybody. No, that's sin. And when you've done those kinds of things and then you just show up and you're like, oh, God's happy with me because I'm at church today. I mean, you're in the right place. So I can tell you that that's not how it works. You get what I'm saying? No, what he wants is he says, he wants you to keep coming back here and keep praising him because you know, man, I am, I I don't deserve to be saved. I don't deserve for him to love me the way that he loves me. I don't deserve for him to, to give his life for a wretch like me. And so that's why I show up. It's because he keeps welcoming me, welcoming me into his house. And he keeps loving me in spite of all of that. But I do think that there is a, there is a sense of where this, this, is, this is like, I think this is really revealed again in and through, I think, the practice of confession. And there are, there are lots of ways that this, I think, has been uh, misused and, and misinterpreted uh, and misapplied um, in, in different uh, ways of, of faith in different places in the church. Um, you know, it's, 
it's been very manipulative at the end of every youth conference you ever went to when you were growing up as a kid. And like, hey, if you want to make a decision, you know, rededicate your life. And then 700 out of 950 kids go to the front and, you know, are crying. And then, you know, all this. It's very, and it's just, it, it, it becomes very manipulative or it becomes, uh, it becomes very, like, dismissive toward actual sin. Like, just, you know, come say a confession and then go out and do it again. And come back and say a confession and you're good. Like, and it just dismisses the fact that, like, that's, like, no. No, like when we, when we realize we've done something wrong, we should leave not going to go do it again, but we should leave going, you know what, I want to try and change. I want to walk with the Spirit, let Him kind of cultivate something new in me, right? And so, but I, but I, but I think what James says in James 5, 16 is really, really powerful and important. He says that we should confess our sins to each other and pray for each other. Because the prayer of righteous people are powerful and effective. That there's healing that takes place through confessing our sins to other people and praying with other people around those things. And it shows a true broken and contrite heart and broken and contrite spirit that God will never turn away. He never turns away someone who comes and is just on their knees saying, God, I've I made a mistake. He loves us. That's why 1 John also says that when we, when we sin, confess our sin, and he's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. So you and I have a way out. And, and it's through confession and through being broken and contrite. We have a way to come closer to the heart of God and what he desires for us. And I'll talk about more of that in just a minute. Let me wrap up here. Verse 18 and 19, he says, May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifice of righteousness and burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So part of um, the prophecy that Nathan brought to David was that this mistake and this sin was really going to truly wreck uh, his his family, and um, and ultimately that like Jerusalem was going to pay a significant price because of this, and so I think this is David's cry to just say, you know, God, you know, forgive me and don't don't hurt the people who are righteous. In this world, and who are doing right by you, I'm the one who's made this mistake. I'm the one who, you know, deserves the punishment, not them. And uh, and so I think this is a part of of David trying to intercede, actually, on behalf of his people, um, because they're he's hoping that they won't reap the consequences of his sin, um, and and he's praying that God will will um, save them from that and keep them uh, from that. So. Um, that's Psalm 51. I, uh, I want to keep this memory verse challenge going. How is Psalm 23 going for y'all? You guys doing all right? Waking up each morning? Saying it? Yeah, you got it? All right. Today we're going to do Psalm 51.10. Psalm 51.10. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. All right, so we're going to say this together a couple times. All right, let's read it together. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. All right, one more time. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. All right, let's take a few words away. All right. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. All right, a few more words. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. All right, let's take them all away. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. All right. You guys got it? My hope is, again, my hope is that you won't just know Psalm 51.10, but that it'll be a prayer from your heart. 
that it'll be a prayer from your heart, that you would want God to do that in you, that you'd want him to transform you and change you into a person who truly is undivided in your passions and unwavering in your desires for him and his will in your life. Um, this morning, we're going to uh, give you an opportunity uh, also uh, as we take communion to respond. So in just a moment, we're going to take communion together, and we're going to come to the tables. There are four. There are two up front and two in the back. Uh, and this opportunity to take the body uh, that's been broken for you uh, on the cross and the blood shed for you on the cross um, in Jesus uh, by taking a little piece of bread and a little cup of juice and remembering that this is his body broken, his blood shed, so that you could be forgiven of your sin. Now, this is the cost, that this is the payment, the price that he had to pay for your for and for your life. And so this is an opportunity for us to come each week and remember that if we were perfect, he wouldn't have to do this, but we're not perfect. And that's why he did this, because he loves us and wants to be in relationship with us. And so this can be a great time to just reflect on the joy of your salvation and know the joy of your salvation, right? To rejoice in the fact that you are free and you are forgiven because of his broken body and shed blood. But this is also an opportunity where you can confess. You can say, God, I'm sorry. God, I've failed. And thank you for this reminder that whenever I fail you, I always have hope because you died on the cross for me. If you've never made a decision to put your faith or trust in Jesus, I'd love to help you make that decision. Like if you've never said, man, I believe that Jesus died for me, that he saved me, that he loves me, that he washed away my sins, and I want to put my faith and my hope in that, I'd love to talk to you about how you can do that. So you can do that. But I'm also going to invite some other people up front this morning. Uh, some of our elders and and uh, and just what I think are uh, righteous people uh, to the best of their ability, they try and live a righteous life, um, and they're going to be up front, and you can come to them, and they're ready to receive you uh, and pray with you. You don't have to, you know. You could just say, "Look, I just I'm kind of broken hearted over my sin." Praise God. And if that's you, then just come and let them just pray for you. You can be honest if there's something specific that you want to confess to someone else, like we're here. And we'll be happy to listen and pray for you. But we really want to challenge you that if you're someone who's come in here today, and it's been a long time since you've been honest, and you've been just <laughs> unapologetic about the fact that like, oh man, like I really screwed up. And I need some help. And I need someone to just be there for me and pray for me. Like, we want to be here to do that. So we're all going to be standing right up here, right up front. Uh, the, the front rows got bigger this week. Uh, praise God. We didn't plan it that way. It just happened. So, like, we can take a seat and we can pray with you. Uh, we have rooms upstairs we can go to if if you want to like really talk or anything else like that like we're here for you but during this time when you respond and take communion I invite you to just come forward you can come forward anytime uh from the time that you move to take communion till the end of the last song uh but just just come forward and i want you to know even if you don't come forward today you can always come you can always come to the altar you can always come and and he's always there for you uh, and, and we'll be there for you too. But you, you just, like, if you don't make a decision to come today, doesn't like you can come tomorrow. Well, we'll be here, some of us, you know. And we'll be happy to talk to you tomorrow or the next day, right? So um, just know that we're here for you and your God loves you. And, uh, and he wants to offer you forgiveness and freedom and hope. All right, so let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for just the way that you love us. Um, God, I pray truly that um, you will forgive us of our sins. 
God, even as I think about the fact that, you know, as I was upstairs this morning working on this sermon and my son was doing something he wasn't supposed to do, I lost my temper and treated him the way he didn't deserve to be treated. God, I just ask that you forgive us for when we let things get in the way we forget the life we're called to live the way we're supposed to walk and be in this world God I pray that you would create in us a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within us Give us. Make us clean. For you will never despise a broken and contrite heart. I love you. Thank you for your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.